Okay, so we're now on to the mechanics part of year one. This is applied year one, chapter eight. Obviously, it starts at chapter eight because of all of applied being put together. And this is a bit of a strange chapter. This is just called modeling in mechanics. And I should mention now that this model, uh, this chapter does also cover the difference between scalar and vector quantities and how to convert from vector to scalar. I'm not going to cover that in this summary because if you're using chapter summaries right now, I know that you already know how to do those things and it comes up again in the later chapters so it gets covered again. However, these things to do with modeling assumptions, I kind of mention it in some of the playlist, but I don't think I go into as much detail as I'm going to do here. And hopefully this will mean that you're always gonna get those little one or two marks where it's talking about how you can criticize the model or how you've used the model in your calculations. So we're gonna talk through these ones that we've got here. I haven't got the full list of them. There are a couple of other ones like something being a rod, which means that it is like a one dimensional object that can't bend. But to be honest, these are the most common ones that come up. You might like to glance over the other ones in the textbook as well. That's also in the video. So let's start off. We look at the word or the phrase, then we look at its meaning. And then crucially, this is the stuff they like to ask about more often, more often than just what it means. So for example, if the question says that the body or the ball or the stone can be modeled as a particle, it means that the dimensions of the object are negligible. Negligible means that it's so small that it can be ignored. So how is it used in calculations? Well, it means that the air resistance can be ignored. If something has got sort of no dimensions, the air is not going to resist its motion. It also means that its dimensions can be ignored. So if we were talking about like a box sliding down a plane, we don't need to care how big the box is. We're just imagining that all of its mass is concentrated at a single point. And I should also mention that as well as air resistance being ignored, then we can also ignore like how it might be spinning around in the air as well, how it might be rotating. Of course, if something is smooth, it means there's no friction and we could ignore the frictional forces. Light, of course, meaning that it has no mass, so we can ignore its mass. But then these are the interesting ones because this is where I think everybody knows the meanings of these, but I don't think that they necessarily know this part, which is how it can be used or how we use it in our calculations. And these are mostly going to be for things with connected particles. So for example, the first one that we have here is a light string, which most people would say like how have you used this in your calculations most people write down that the string has no mass but this is not correct what we actually need to say for this question how it's used in calculations is that the tension is equal throughout the string now why is that because if i can explain why you might be able to sort of understand a bit better so with a light string let's imagine that we've got a, a mass here and we've got a, um, a box that's been attached to that mass. Now, because the string is light, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the top of the string or the bottom of the string, the tension that we have, so any of these arrows that we've got here, they are all going to be equal. I wonder if I wanna do the arrows that way around. Maybe I'll actually do them this way around. So imagining that we're like, imagining it from the top of the ceiling here, it doesn't matter in any of these places, the tension is equal. Now, that's not a good explanation for this. The better explanation is to imagine, what about if the rope was very thick like this and it's attached to the ceiling and it's now being attached to the box as well? Well, if it was at the bottom, the bottom part is only having to hold on to the mass of the, sorry, the weight of the mass. Whereas at the very top, there's gonna to be a big tension because this part of the string is supporting the weight of the mass, but it's also supporting the weight of the string. So you can see here, the tension at the top is obviously gonna be much bigger than the tension that is at the bottom. And you saw me kind of hesitating about which way around to draw the arrows because I've drawn the arrows from the perspective of the ceiling. If I was drawing the arrows from the perspective of the box, then obviously they would be flipped around. So crucially here, the reason that why the tension is equal throughout the string is because if it wasn't, if the string had mass, the top part is having to support the whole of this heavy string plus the, the mass, whereas the bottom part is just supporting the mass. I like to think of this as like a sort of a thin string and this is like a big heavy rope. It kind of helps us visualize what's going on there. Now, if we have something that is an inextensible string, people often write down the string cannot stretch. But where we've used this in our calculation is that if it's connecting two particles, the acceleration of both particles is equal. So if we imagine that we have got one particle here, and another particle here, and they are being connected by an inextensible string, meaning it cannot stretch. If this particle was going to move, well, the whole thing will have to move. If I'm dragging the one that's on the right-hand side, if that one's moving, the one on the left is certainly going to be moving because this cannot stretch. If it could stretch, then in theory,
theory, we could drag this one along and the string would just keep stretching and the other one could stay in its place that we've got there. So what I mean by this is if they are both, if it is an inextensible string, they have the same acceleration, okay? And we often use this in calculations because when we do connected particles, we will often do simultaneous equations and we have to use the same value of the acceleration for both of them. So that's actually where we use it in the calculations. And then our last one that we're gonna talk about is a smooth pulley. This means that there is no friction at the pulley. Great, but how are we actually using that in our calculations? It means that the tension in the string either side of the pulley is equal. So here's the pulley that we've got here. I wonder if I can do a better circle than that, if it will make a circle for me. And if we imagine some str uh, string sort of draped over it like this, if I can draw that in. Now, if this, if, again, I'm always thinking of the opposite. If the pulley was not smooth, let's imagine that this surface here was very, very rough you could have a heavy weight here that we are trying to pull down. And as you try and pull that down, you're making a lot of tension in this string that we've got here. We're making a lot of tension. But because it's rough, this side might not even be feeling that tension because it's all getting caught up on this part. I mean, there could be very, very tiny tension on that side. As soon as it becomes smooth, it means it's not getting caught at all on the top surface of the pulley. So whatever the tension is on one side, it is exactly equal to the tension on the other side. And you're thinking, well, how do we use this in our calculations? Like I just said, with connected particles, we often set up simultaneous equations where we have to use that the tension is equal throughout the string. So that's actually where it's being used in the calculations, okay? And then the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is some modeling assumptions where they ask you to kind of criticize the model or to suggest a refinement to the model. So if in the question they have said that G is used as 9.8, maybe they've even used it as 10, then a good criticism is to say that you could use a more accurate value for G. This has been rounded to two significant figures. I think it's 9.81 and it just goes on and on and on. If the question says that the particle or the body is experiencing constant resistance, well, it might be better to say that the resistance is varying with speed. That's actually how it, it, it works in real life. So if you ever see constant resistance, you can criticize that and say that it shouldn't be constant. It should vary with speed. If it is being described as a particle, obviously check the context of the question, we could say that we could consider the dimensions of the body, particularly if we're talking about like a box that was sliding down a plane. It might be useful to know in terms of how far the box has slid, how big the box actually is. If we're talking about something that is being thrown or projected in the air, if it's a particle, we could say, okay, let's take the spin of the body into account, meaning it might not go in a direct sort of pathway of its being thrown. And of course, we can also include air resistance, as we talked about here. We said that as particle means that we can ignore air resistance. So if we criticize the use of modeling it as a particle, we could take air resistance into account. Sometimes they've done this very sneaky thing in edXL recently. They've said, apart from including air resistance, what else could we do to refine the model? So that's why I'm giving you a list of these other ones to think about. Of course, if something is smooth, you can say that's not going to be likely. Let's take friction into account. If something is light, we can say take its mass into account. That could be the string. Uh, that could be a different particle, whatever it might be. This one, I haven't really said what it is uh, because it kind of doesn't fall into something that's in the model. But if it's about a projectile, something being th uh, flown or thrown through the air, I mean, you could take the wind speed and the direction into account because obviously if you're throwing something and it's windy, that is going to change the way that this particle might go. So hopefully these bits down here have given you a bit of an idea about why the tension is equal throughout the string, why they are both moving at the same acceleration and why the tension is equal either side of the pulley. Because uh, hopefully if you know why, it should make it a bit easier to remember these things. And it's especially for these parts where it says, how is it used in the calculations? Often this isn't typically the answer they're looking for. So do make sure that you've had a look at these. Okay, guys, I will hope to see you in the next video where we start doing some actual mechanics-y sort of maths-y problems.